Hey, what's up? It's Ben Greenfield, and today's podcast is all about ketosis. Uh, but of course, one of the ways that you can get yourself into an extremely deep state of ketosis is by mobilizing fatty acids from adipose tissue. And what's one of the best ways to do that? Caffeine, coffee. Green tea works pretty well too, but coffee is tastier in my opinion. And a sponsor for today's show actually creates not just coffee, but coffee that has brains vitamins added to it. Brain vitamins, vitamins, however you want to pronounce it. Things like alpha GPC, taurine, L-theanine, DMAE. These are all things that help to increase focus and power output and cognition. They're all natural amino acids, typically found in foods, but not always easy enough to get from diet alone. They help to protect and prolong coffee's dopamine effect and reduce the anxiety you can get from coffee. Uh, this stuff is called Chimera Coffee, K-I-M-E-R-A, K-O-F-F-E. Uh, and you can go to chimericoffee.com and use code Ben to get 10% off. That's chimericoffee.com and code Ben. The stuff tastes really good because it's single estate artisan coffee from the Dominican Republic grown at an altitude of 5,000, count them, 5,000 feet, run by the same family for over 40 years. Uh, plus, they add the vitamins to it. Did I mention that? So good stuff. Chimericoffee.com and use code Ben to get 10% off. Speaking of tasty things, this this podcast is also brought to you by Blue Apron, and yes, you can maintain a state of ketosis and still eat deliciously with some of the meals from Blue Apron, like they have their sesame soba noodles. Those are not ketogenic, I guarantee, but they're really tasty with gylon mushrooms and ginger lime peanuts. They also have marinated chicken thighs with jalapeno rice and summer squash. I suppose if you skip the rice, that would be ketogenic. Uh, and then they have their cod and tomatillo salsa with summer squash. And that one is amazing. I love me a little bit of cod. You can get any of this stuff over at blueapron.com. And not only that, but you can get your first three meals free with free shipping at blueapron.com slash Ben. You get these amazing meals for less than 10 bucks per person per meal. You can make them in 40 minutes or less. My kids love it because they get these cool little cards, all the ingredients. So my kids actually learn to cook using this stuff and it tastes amazing. So check it out. Blueapron.com slash Ben. In this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show. What they saw is that with fatty acid, you can yield 120 plus molecules of ATP, whereas glucose, which apparently, you know, it, it, it generates more heat when it burns, it's maximum 96. You really trash your metabolism at a very young age. And to fix it, I think you have to sometimes really reach to quite drastic measures. And I think ketosis can be also a fix. It can be a metabolic fix that doesn't have to be ongoing for the rest of your life necessarily. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place, right here, right now on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey folks, it's Ben Greenfield and I've got a few paradoxical food ideas for you. Like how about ketogenic pizza or ketogenic toast? or 
ketogenic cornflakes. And uh, yes, each of these and uh, many of the carbolicious food items that you may associate with a high carbohydrate intake actually do exist in a, a low carb, high fat and relatively nutrient dense form. Uh, you just have to know what to do, and you have to be willing to think outside the box of how a lot of a lot of I guess how how many ketogenic eaters operate, which is basically by drinking like copious amounts of of full fat coconut milk and buying avocados by the dozen and going through a a stick of butter every couple of days or perhaps every single morning in your coffee. And the fact is that there's there, I mean like that's not necessarily what you have to do. It doesn't have to be like all avocados and coconut oil. And and, and sticks of butter everywhere, you can actually make really good food uh, if you have the right tools on hand. And my guests on today's show just wrote this book that's called The Ketogenic Kitchen. And it's got like 250 recipes in it. But even more interesting to me, it also has some pretty comprehensive like scientific information for those of you nerds and geeks out there who want to kind of kind of delve into the science behind why and how you make these type of foods. Uh, and it also is based on my own experimentation with the recipes in this book written by people who actually know what they're doing in terms of making actual healthy food. Uh, that tastes good, uh, high fat, healthy food that tastes good. So uh, this book was written by two people, both of whom are on today's show. Uh, the first is uh, Dominie Kemp. Uh, Dominie, is it Dominie or Dominie? It is. No, it's Dominie. You got it right. Dominie, boom. <laughs> uh, Dominie is an award-winning chef. She's a food writer and she's an entrepreneur. And in 2013, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she shifted her focus to a ketogenic diet. And as you've heard on this show before, that is uh, one of the best ways to control the growth of cancer and also to prevent cancer is to limit uh, the amount of, of glucose that you have available for mitochondria. Uh, she did that and she uh, wrote this book, which is actually her fifth cookbook. She also has a, a juice company, a Whole Foods Cafe, and uh, she's, she knows a lot about healthy cooking and healthy eating. And her co-author is also on the show today, Patricia. What's up, Patricia? Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, and and Patricia uh, Daly, uh, she's a nutritional therapist. Uh, she's an author who specializes in cancer care and the ketogenic diet. Uh, she's worked with hundreds of cancer patients in Ireland, uh, and uh, that's why you're going to hear her lolling Irish accent. Uh, she lectures at the Irish Institute of Nutrition and Health, um, and uh, she's written quite a few books. One even that that I kind of worked with her on a little bit, and it's it's called Practical Keto Plans for Endurance Athletes, and I'll, mm. I'll link to that in the show notes, al along with this other book, the book that we're going to talk about today, The Ketogenic Kitchen. And you can access the show notes for all this stuff that we talk about. Uh, if you just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash keto, Keto Kitchen. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Keto Kitchen. So, uh, Patricia and Dominique, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Ben. It's lovely to be here. Yeah. yeah, lovely to lovely to chat. Finally, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, now you 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 kind of both have, and I don't know if this was awkward for y'all, but you kind of have like your own unique approach to eating. Like it seems like one of you is kind of like a little bit more liberal. One of you is I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, like a little bit more strict. Like, can you go into <laughs> uh, the difference between your two different dietary approaches or philosophies? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head there. Um, I suppose I took a more liberal approach to and, carbohydrates. And wait, to, to interrupt real quick, this is Dominique speaking, right? This is Dominique, okay, sorry. Gotcha. You'll, you'll notice, you'll, you'll, you'll hear Patricia's Swiss slash Irish accent <laughs> going, but um, yeah, this is Dominique here. So I took a more liberal approach to carbohydrates than Patricia does. So she, she would follow a ketogenic diet fully. Um, I found low carb um, works for me and I suppose, suppose trying to be a, a bit more sort of fat adapted and um, I guess because I'm a chef and I work with food, I would find it hard to be in ketosis all the time. So for me, it, it's about um, sort of following low carb 80, 90% of the time and then being a little bit flexible um, with that other 10%. And I suppose... The book is, is in two halves. So my half was low carb and, and really trying to get people to get their head around embracing healthy fats because 
for years, I probably for 40 years, I would have followed the food pyramid and, and eaten a very low fat, high carb diet, um, which clearly didn't suit me. And it was really after getting breast cancer in 2013, um, for the second time, I had had a malignant melanoma in my 20s. Um, and it was really at that point when I was in the oncology ward and handed a food pyramid uh, leaflet and said, you know, this is this is <laughs> this is what we advise you to eat. Um, I just suddenly thought, you know what, there must be a better way. And that's when I started really researching and trying to find out what I should be eating going through treatment. Uh, and then I met Patricia. And after everything, we said, right, let's write the book. We both wished we'd had access to when we were um, both diagnosed. And, and that was the start of a fantastic friendship and uh, working relationship. And it's just been an incredibly interesting and fascinating journey that we're <laughs> always learning and, and always uh, uh, trying to find out more. It's really exciting time. Yeah, and I think it's interesting how when you're laying out the fact that you, Dominique, are a little bit more kind of like uh, like liberal in terms of not doing like like a strict carbohydrate restrictive approach, like you delve into, for example, a really interesting study back in 2012 where they took a bunch of overweight and obese uh, young adults and they had them all eat the same number of calories and one group got a low fat diet and one group got a, a low glycemic index diet and one got a low carbohydrate diet and uh, the, the low glycemic index diet and the low carbohydrate diet both saw some pretty significant benefits, you know, even though the low carbohydrate diet, I think was like 10% carbohydrate and the low glycemic mm -hmm. index was, I think about 40% carbohydrate. You still saw some benefits from just being, you know, just freaking careful with blood sugar fluctuations, even if you're not doing like full on ketosis or something like that. That's exactly right. And, um, I found, uh, you know, myself just over the last year or so, um, actually measuring, my own blood glucose just occasionally to see what spikes it, what doesn't. Um, because again, the more you learn, the more you want to learn. And, you know, just seeing how everything from exercise and even sort of good carbohydrates, how, how you know, things like chick chickpeas or, or lentils or anything, how they can spike even a very small amount. And it's been really interesting to kind of see what works and what doesn't work. So, you know, I'm a chef and, and so I, you know, would eat carbohydrates if I could morning, noon and night, preferably slathered in fat and protein. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, it's, it's, I, I find uh, eating this way, it, it's terribly satisfying, but you do need to be clever and you do need to try and, and, and figure out ways around it um, because, you know, we exist in a world where carbohydrates are just in abundance everywhere you look. Um, and so it's really trying to to find ways of adapting and, and getting your family to sort of um, join join in the quest, as it were, to just try and reduce down yeah. the amount of, of sugar we eat. Right. And because I don't want to give people the impression that that like, you know, I'm necessarily like like anti-carbohydrate. I mean, even when you look at, mm. at the, the blue zones, you know, you read a book like Dan Bootner's uh, Blue Zones or, or a recent one I read mm. by by Dr. Daphne Miller called The Jungle Effect. Uh, many of the long living populations and very healthy populations spread across the face of the planet, you see a, a pretty liberal amount of uh, not just wild plant intake, which is a prevailing characteristic, but also uh, the consumption of carbohydrates, uh, but carbohydrates mm. that are fiber rich and also very low glycemic index uh, legumes, for yeah. example, you know, you look, look at Dan Bootner's blue zones and, and like legumes are a huge part of, of many of the foods. And you look at like the, I, I believe they're called the three sisters in like, you know, Native American cuisine, you know, corn and squash and exactly. I'm totally blanking on what the last one is now. Uh, <laughs> is it, is it beets, corn, squash and beets? I do, ah, now I'm feeling like an idiot. The, the, or some, the, maybe the, some other yeah, root. The, the yeah, three sisters, but, yeah. but ultimately they are, they're low glycemic index uh, carbohydrates. And when combined with the fact that the other characteristic of many of these blue zones is the fact that they engage in low level physical activity all day long, which also controls mm. blood sugar levels. You know, I, I think that, that you can necessarily, you know, you, you, you can definitely make an argument that, you know, th this idea of just simply paying attention to blood sugar regulation and not necessarily eating like strict ketosis is still going to give some, some pretty significant uh, benefits from a longevity and blood sugar standpoint. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's always also interesting to see where you start. 
because these people, that's how they grew up. And the kids, they probably never got any refined carbs or they never got those, you know, junk foods that we basically or I see a lot of kids in Ireland uh, grow up with and just really excess sugar. I mean, way um above the WHO guidelines. Yeah. And uh, so you you really trash your metabolism at a very young age. And to fix it, I think you have to sometimes really reach to quite drastic measures. And I think ketosis can be also a fix. It can be a metabolic fix that doesn't have to be ongoing for the rest of your life necessarily. And uh, we also see it, I mean, the ketogenic diet comes from uh, the epileptic world. That's how it all started. And that's where we have the most evidence. And uh, epileptic children, they quite often, they're kept on a ketogenic diet for two years and then they're weaned. So, yeah. you know, it's, and it, it has to be a dynamic process, really, I think, with carbs that you can't just say, OK, I'm just going to stay at 12 grams of net carbs for the rest of my life. This is probably not going to work. And it's really looking at the individual where they're at in terms of as you said, you know, all the other lifestyle aspects and community and sleep and, mm. uh, you know, there's stress. so much, yeah, yeah stress, <laughs> that's so much that influences our blood glucose. I think for me uh, at this stage now, you know, I've been keto now for, I started in 2012 and I uh, was really strict at the beginning. And now I sort of start to realize there's other things that have an even bigger impact now on my glucose than, um, than food. So it seems that, you know, the body has sort of adapted and uh, but there's other stress source that um, I have to really keep an eye on, mm -hmm. like sleep deprivation, um, stress and um, feeling overwhelmed sometimes, you know, that can that can or fear, you know, fear of, of a relapse yeah. when I get sick. Sometimes I do get, you know, scared and uh, that all influences then, um, you know, glucose and, and lots of other markers. Yeah. And, and then Patricia, in contrast to Domini, you're like a lot of your recipes in the book, because some of the recipes are, are like, you know, kind of like Domini mentioned more liberal. And then all of your recipes are like no more than like, I think like five to 10% carbohydrate intake and involve, I guess, what would be considered like a little bit more of like a strict ketogenic approach. I suppose yeah. for someone who wanted more of that metabolic therapy, like, like who might have cancer or epilepsy or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's when it has to be really monitored and where, you know, people have to really start weighing their food, at least initially, and just really learn as much as they can about quantities of food, um, you know, how much how much of what they can eat and uh, really learn a lot initially. It can be quite overwhelming for people. But yeah, as you say, um, my, I have meal plans actually in my part because that's what I found when I was working with people. They said, oh, it's great to have recipes, but it's the, the magic comes when it's all being put together and also using leftovers. And uh, I'm a big fan of you know, not, not wasting food. Um, so I decided to do meal plan, plans in my part of um, of the book in the second part. And it starts with, I think, 48 grams of net carbs. Mm -hmm. And then over two weeks, it goes down to 12 grams and then two weeks of, of 12 grams. And that's, you know, the 12 grams is, um, it's mainly, I think it's Tom Seafried uh, from Boston College who mainly came, came up with the 12 grams. And obviously that can be a bit dependent on the individual. Uh, but that's what we went for in the book as well, because it's very, very challenging to have uh, only 12 grams of net carbs, but also have, you know, a lot of nutrient density. And that's really my focus. As you said, you know, <laughs> at the beginning, I'm not one to recommend putting loads of butter into your coffee or just <laughs> uh, drinking olive oil. That's the questions I, <laughs> I sometimes ask. Mm, and, uh, you know, how, I love how me do you... a big, big glass of olive oil for breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, that's so what tasty. <laughs> so yeah. functional. So. so so what you're saying is that uh your your definition of low carb, and it sounds like it's pretty close to my definition of low carb, would be like I think in the book you say about fifty to one hundred grams of carbohydrates per day, and then ketosis would be kind of closer to like that that less than fifty grams ish range. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And uh 
I, I also have the experience with people that as they once they're really adapted and they're sort of fat optimized or they're fat adapted. So which means it's not the same as being in ketosis. It means that your body preferentially uses fat as opposed to to carbs. So uh, even if the carbs are there, you know, it's it's only used when it's when it really has to. So, for instance, in, in exercise, but of. of Otherwise, preferentially, fat is being the main source of fuel. And I do see with me as well, especially when when I went uh, increased my training load a little bit again, um, I could definitely tolerate more carbs and still be in ketosis. Yeah. And you even mentioned this in the book, like you have a carbohydrate sensitivity quiz. And it, mm. it, it's kind of like, I, I guess it'd be kind of similar to like, you know, Rob Wolf just wrote this new book called wired to Mm. eat that I interviewed him about in which he gives all the instructions for getting a blood glucose monitor and just taking every meal that you eat and monitoring your blood sugar response to see your carbohydrate sensitivity. But you guys have a little bit more of like a, I guess, just like this really simple quiz approach where if you take this quiz and you have high carbohydrate sensitivity, you might be one of those people who would want to switch to you know, using more of, I guess, like Patricia's recipes in the book or or exactly. doing more of the ketosis instead of the low carb until you can restore some of that insulin sensitivity and carbohydrate mm. sensitivity. Yeah, exactly. And that was a wonderful quiz and that we we borrowed very generously from Dr. Georgia E that um, for the book. Um, and it, I think it just gives a good overview as to whether people, um, as I said, you know, I would have definitely followed a high carb, low fat diet for years. And you know, I think when you when you make the switch and you cut out carbohydrates and you look at fasting and all the benefits of that, and as Patricia talked about being fat adapted, um, I think it's amazing how you know before I would have constantly I would have eaten breakfast and then you know by eleven o'clock would be feeling that slump and tired and cranky and hungry and always thinking you know of of the slump and my next meal. Whereas now you know to be able to go twenty four hours and and fast regularly you know, you just, you feel so much better. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's really interesting the way the body can adapt. And, and it just, you know, I think what we find is, is a lot of people, you know, there, it can be very, very divisive at the moment between, you know, low carb, uh, ketosis, uh, ketogenic diets, low fat, you know, everything has got very, very controversial. Um, and I think what we find is that, you know, keep saying there isn't the one perfect diet for everyone. It really depends on what suits you. And, you know, the two of us have written this book, but we both eat slightly differently. But the one thing we have in common is just really reducing carbohydrates. And if it suits and you do that quiz and you find out, you know, yes, probably carbs, a high carb diet doesn't suit you. I think it's it's such a great way to eat um, and you just you can feel so good. And, you know, there are so many recipes in the book where, I suppose you we can replace things like pizza and so on and so forth and cornflakes, you know, as you touched on earlier, um, that you can still feel really, really satisfied. And I think, yeah. you know, you can't forget that eating has to be extremely pleasurable. It's such a wonderful thing to do, you know, socially, physically, you know, the whole lot. It's just an incredibly pleasurable thing. And I think, um, you know, for me as a chef, really important that all the recipes um are, are really tasty in and i think that we've we've done that at least i hope we have <laughs> yeah i definitely want to get into some of your recipes but i actually had a couple other questions just just a couple overview questions for you one of the things you talk about that i thought was interesting that i haven't i haven't seen many people talk about much before is this idea that if you're eating too many calories and you're eating like like a higher fat lower carbohydrate ketogenic diet um, excessive calorie consumption on that diet seems to have some pretty significant consequences. Can you go into what happens if, if you're doing like it, like let's say a ketogenic diet, but you're just eating like too many damn calories, like, like what happens that is unique to eating too many calories on something like a ketogenic diet? Yeah, it was basically, uh, that goes back to a paper that was, uh, published in 2012. It was Tom Seafried was one of the authors and uh, I think the lead uh, scientist with uh, Meidenbauer was his name and uh, they did show that on an unrestricted ketogenic diet so when it was a mouse study when they could feed as much as they wanted they they developed issues especially with um, their lipid profile I think the uh, mainly triglycerides they went up as well and uh, they sort of 
uh, showed the signs of, of early uh, heart disease as well. So I think it's hard to overeat um, on a ketogenic diet, but it's definitely possible. That's why we're talking about it. And also the, the other very interesting thing is, and I, was, um, I often talk with Alex Ferretti, a colleague of mine who is um, based in the UK. He more sort of specializes in um, athletic performance and ketogenic diet. So he he did... Um, you mean uh, Alessandro Ferretti, that guy? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I hung out with him. Uh, he he was at, I think when I was in London at the Biohackers Conference in London, he was at that one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So they, they're doing with um, uh, Waco, can't remember his last name. Um, they, they're doing quite a bit of research into, um, you know, calories on a ketogenic diet. And what they realized is that if you, and now it's getting a bit nerdy, but if you take the uh, 18 carbons of a, uh, uh, you know, fatty acid, so um, an 18 carbon fatty acid, and um, you compare that with um, three three molecules of glucose, which also then has, um, it's a six carbon molecule, so three times six is 18 as well, so that you can compare it. And what they saw is that with the fatty acid, you can yield 120 plus ATP, molecules of ATP, whereas glucose, which um, it, it, provides, it generates more heat when it burns, it's maxim, maximum 96. So we also see there that it's actually a more effective, a more efficient way of generating energy. And that's why you probably have to reduce your calorie intake so that you can really compare a ketogenic diet with um you know, a normal standard diet, uh, especially in, in trials. I think that's one of the downfalls of some trials as well. And that has never really been explored that way. But if you want to really be genuinely isocaloric, so if you want to compare two diets and the ketogenic diet is one of them, you probably have to go down on the calories. And yeah. uh, so that's, you know, it, I see that all the time as well, because it, it can be hard to actually... Um, really eat all the calories your appetite changes definitely mm -hmm. and not in a negative way it's just you don't actually feel the need to eat all the time yeah so that's actually like like when when you bring up some of the issues with the labs like i see that a lot of times with folks who are i guess you see it more with athletes who are eating a ketogenic diet you actually see things like really elevated blood glucose and like high LDL and low HDL with high triglycerides and a lot of these mm. issues that I think come from just like doing the ketosis thing, but just like eating too much, like just, just yeah. too much food, like, like not, not that the other issue isn't a problem too. you know, people starving themselves into things like amenorrhea and, you know, lower, mm. low thyroid and low testosterone. But yeah, I mean, you, you can't just like switch to ketosis and just like stuff face with copious amounts of oil in your coffee and mm. assume you're going to be good to go. To, it's a and good I point that you're making there. Yeah. Yeah. I think nutrients yeah. as well. I mean, so many people still haven't copped on that. Um, you really need to get your nutrients in. If you can tolerate vegetables, please eat your vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I know of people who, who can't, you know, they have a salicylate um, allergy or for whatever reason, they just do not tolerate um, vegetables yeah. and that's okay. But if you do tolerate them, please eat them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There's actually a really, really, really good new book about that, about why a lot of people don't tolerate vegetables and, and what you can do about that. It's called The Plant Paradox uh, by mm. Dr. Stephen Gundry. It's actually a, a really good book. Uh, yeah. For, yeah. for those of you listening, I'll link to anything I mentioned. If, if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash keto kitchen, I'll, uh, I'll put that one in there. Uh, but, but you guys also, uh, one, one of the things you mentioned that, that I was kind of curious about, cause I haven't seen this much is, uh, you're actually recommending that, uh, especially like, like a cancer patients, uh, steer away from whey protein. Uh, wh why is it mm. that, that, that would be the case? Well, it's it again. It depends a little bit. And interestingly, I was talking about this. Um, I was at the conference in um, Florida, in Tampa, in February, the Metabolic Therapeutics Conference, and I was talking uh, to Andrew Kutnick, who is um, who specialises in cachexia, so rapid weight loss um, for in in cancer patients. Right. And um, so it's a very very tricky condition. Nobody really knows um, what to do about it. There's no drugs that can stop it. There's a few things we can do, um, uh, but the, you know, in terms of the pharma, pharma companies basically are 
you know, just pulling their hair out because they can't find um, what exactly is going on. So it's definitely a lot to do with metabolism, um, no doubt. And um, I so, sort of said, okay, would whey protein have a place there? And he said, they think so. So I think for somebody who is um, who needs that IGF-1 boost or insulin boost as well from to put on weight, for instance, um, it can have its place in cancer patients. But again, I would really do that, um, you know, with somebody who understands exactly what they're doing. And otherwise, I and as I just mentioned, it's mainly the IGF-1 or insulin spike that um, whey protein can elicit. So that's the main reason. Okay, gotcha. So I mean, it's really good though for you because of that. At like, I you know, I people I'm helping put on muscle or gain weight. Like I'm I'm a huge fan of whey protein. But you're just saying yeah. you're okay. So it's the insulin and the insulin like growth factor spike that that is yeah. the reason you're not a fan of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Got because it. it's one of the pathways for that can be used for cancer proliferation. In which, and we, in we which would case, like, yeah. In which case, I'm assuming you would recommend if someone was going to use a protein like like a pea or a, or a hemp protein or something like that. Exactly, yeah. Hemp is sort of my my preferred. Or there's some mix mixtures as well, hemp and pea. Uh, so yeah, there's some nice ones out there. So I would go for the plant rather than whey or something else. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and then also to get into to like ingredients, uh, you're also uh, one one of the sweeteners that you talk about in there. Of course, you you mentioned stevia as being something that you utilize a lot in these recipes. That I know we're going to take a dive into some of the tasty recipes here in a little bit. But you also talk about this special kind of syrup. Uh, uh, y <laughs> Y A C O N is it yacon? Yacon syrup. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, it's actually it's 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 quite interesting because. Damini and I, we sort of, first of all, we didn't want to put desserts in there at all <laughs> because we were sort of, what's the point? Because we actually want people to eat whole foods and to actually steer people away from sweets. So let's just ditch it. And then the publishers were, mm, but you can't really write a cookbook without a, a section. And then also, in my experience, it can really be the make or break for, for certain patients. If they really have, in their view, nothing to look forward to when it comes to food, they just simply will not go there. And uh, that's why for some people it's a crutch and it's a very important crutch and they need their sweets, um, you know, every now and then. And I do emphasize, please don't, you know, make that whatever white chocolate tort every single day. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is for special occasions. But yeah, the Yakon syrup, it was funny because um, some of my clients were sort of, oh, I can't have honey. I can't have maple syrup. I can't have agave syrup. So what is there left? And we're all about sort of giving people options. And I researched what is there left sort of in terms of, you know, that nice um, liquidy sweetener. And obviously stevia is just drops. It doesn't have the same consistency as, as some lovely honey or maple syrup. So yakon syrup is actually the closest and uh, it has a lot of um, fructo oligosaccharides, which can be really beneficial for the gut and can feed uh, some gut bacteria. I mean, some people do not respond well. <laughs> so, um, but it's like, for instance, inulin as well, or, you know, chewing some artichokes, it's, it could be extremely beneficial for the gut if somebody tolerates it well. And also it, it seems to have some beneficial effects on metabolism. Um, okay. It's even been sort of, there's even a study into weight loss for y and yacon syrup. I think that's, um, you know, I don't know why it's they did it. Too far. <laughs> yeah. And, and you far, can yeah. you can just get like like just just pure raw yakon syrup off of like Amazon the same way that you would get like like yak, like raw honey for example. Yeah, I mean it, it's I can't. It's find available it in, in the health food stores over here. Yeah. so I'm, I'm sure if it's available in Ireland in the health yeah, food if stores, get, it if you can get it in Ireland, you can probably find it in, in the US. Yeah, anywhere. Yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Although apparently the Guinness is a lot better over there. Oh, that's true. But, um, okay, let's let's start to delve into some of these recipes because you, there's some unique things in here I wanted to ask you about. So, uh, so first of all, um, you you talk about toasts, toast in the book, like ketogenic toast. How the heck do you actually have toast or make toast on a ketogenic diet? Because like we're huge toast fans at the Greenfield House. My wife <laughs> makes sourdough bread all the time. It's it's you know it's it's definitely just like pure carbohydrates. It's it's not like a ketogenic. But I'm curious, like like how does one actually do ketogenic toast? 
Well, there's there are actually, in fairness, there's some fantastic bread recipes in the um, uh, in the book, and there's a lovely hazelnut bread, and there's a lovely uh, coconut focaccia. We've got time. Go go into how you how you make it. I mean, you don't have to. Obviously, we want people to get the book, but at the same time, I mean, like, uh, f- fill us fill us yeah, in. Yeah, I think the one that we we call toast in you know it, sort of in quotes in inverted commas. That's the one that is made. It was mainly made um, with seeds, I think. So um, sunflower seeds. We're just trying to look it up here. <laughs> uh, what well, I think it's at the beginning of of my part, where you know you can. It, it is quite crunchy. You actually, there's there's quite a lot of cracker recipes, and uh, they do come out pretty crunchy. But it's, I mean, that's why you put it into inverted no, they're, commas. They're crackers are supposed to be crunchy. Yeah, exactly. So it's not sort of the nice moist part that your toast would have, but um, you know, it's pretty. It comes pretty close. So uh, that's what what we use. I have this um, recipe. I think it's with shiitake mushrooms and maybe eggs as well. And people just say, but what do I eat that with? So that's why. Yeah, but how do you how do you make the actual toast, like the the bread or whatever, or the crackers? Like what's the recipe to to actually make these things? There's one recipe for cracking crackers and that's at the um, in my section. And actually they are they're wonderful uh, when you are craving like something to have with cheese or something like that. Um, and they are bound with some psyllium husks. And um, again, a really good selection of seeds. And you bake them until they're really good and crisp. And what I always tell people to do is, because uh, you sort of roll them out into a sheet. And once they start um, drying out on the outside, break those bits off and keep cooking them until they're really, really dry and crisp. Uh, and make sure you don't put them into an airtight container while they're still warm. Otherwise, they'll end up soggy. But um, they're like toast. <laughs> uh, but they're they're fantastic. And uh, yeah, people, you know, regardless of whether they're following low carb or not, they absolutely adore them. Um, and uh, Patricia is a great one. The kale crackers. The kale crackers. That's what we call what we sell as toast, basically. So Wait, it's, they're it's, they're uh, kale crackers. It's kale, yeah. So it's kale, Brazil nuts, sunflower seeds, and then uh, you bind all this with eggs, and you put some onion as well, and uh, a little bit of coconut oil, and then just spices and salt. And um, so depending on if you make them for kids or for adults, you can vary the, the spices a little bit. But I actually made them um, for the school recently. I went into uh, my uh, five year old's uh, school and the kids just love making those crackers because it's all handiwork. And they can just uh, I prepared everything at home and they're basically like builders just putting putting the dough down and just making it as thin as possible. And then um, you just put it in the oven and you make sure, as somebody said, you just, um, you know, sort of take off the uh, on on the edges initially when it's really nice and crisp. And then the middle sometimes takes a bit longer. Um, But it's really they're really lovely. And most kids just, you know, in in the school, they absolutely adored them. And uh, mom's told me they're making them at home now, especially because you can involve the kids. Yeah. So that's kale crackers, for instance, and then um, we've got some other recipes. We've got about three or four different cracker recipes, and then bread as well. And they're all uh, they are mainly, you know, there's vegetables, quite a bit of vegetables in them, and then um, or nuts and seeds as well. Okay. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about the many uses of this stuff called Moringa, M-O-R-I-N-G-A. Moringa is this tree that grows in South Asia, and it's been used in Ayurvedic medicine for over 300 different diseases for thousands of years. Sometimes it's called the miracle tree, and it's because these tiny little round leaves that they have, uh, it's also called the horseradish tree, by the way, are packed with things like protein and calcium and beta carotene and vitamin C and potassium. It has a extremely rich nutrient profile, antioxidants galore, 
more. It lowers blood sugar levels. It reduces inflammation. It protects against metal toxicity. Who knew? Uh, and it is a key component in this green superfood that I toss into my smoothie every day called Organifi. It's a coconut and ashwagandha infused green juice. It's a gently dried superfood powder, not heat oxidized like a lot of the green powders that you get out there. It's called Organifi Green Juice. And you get 20% off of this stuff. And yes, did I mention it has Moringa in it? Uh, just use code Ben for 20% off. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Organifi. Organifi is spelled with an I, Organifi. Uh, and use discount code Ben to get 20% off. Uh, this podcast is also used by this electrical muscle stimulation machine that can be used to target any muscle group on your body. And it can allow you to train at your maximum capacity to use proper biomechanics over a hundred different professional sports teams around the world use this handy dandy little device it knocks out injuries in an extremely fast amount of time it's fda cleared for pain relief and i use it on everything from my low back to my knees like my elbows after a day of typing or pull-ups i mean like the sky's the limit with this thing Plus, you can travel with it. TSA doesn't care. Trust me. I've tried. Uh, it's called the Mark Pro, M-A-R-C Pro. And you get a 5% discount on it, which is actually pretty significant. Um, you go to markpro.com and use promo code BEN. That's M-A-R-C Pro.com and use discount code BEN to get your 5% off the Mark Pro. Enjoy. And now back to today's show. All right, earmuffs for the kids, you guys, earmuffs for the kids. Uh, as you've probably heard me talk about before, the fitness industry is full of a lot of bullshit, including the fact that celebrities are out there trumping their workouts as the go-to workout that's going to get you the perfect magazine cover model look. But in fact, either those celebrities aren't doing the actual workout that you're reading about or they're doing that, but also injecting testosterone up their right butt cheek and engaging in all manner of other risky business to really, truly get the body that you're seeing on Hollywood, not to mention a little bit of Photoshopping and airbrushing involved. Anyways, though, uh, I have a couple of friends. Uh, well, more than a couple. I've got uh, three guys who I turn to when it comes to kind of kind of like peeling back some of the deep and deep dirty and dark secrets of the fitness industry. And these guys do a pretty good job of it. They're more willing to, uh, to, to piss people off than I am, frankly. And, uh, and they do so in their show. It's called Mind Pump. Mind Pump. You should check these guys out. Mindpumpmedia.com. And if you want to listen to an episode that is a perfect example of what I just explained to you, you should go listen to their episode on Zach Efron's Baywatch workout. Not only are these cats funny, uh, but they also do a really, really good job just basically ripping to shreds all of the problems in the fitness and the health and the nutrition industry industry. They're really cool dudes. Uh, so check out episode 518. It'd be a good place to start. Mindpumpmedia.com or on iTunes. Zach Efron's Baywatch workout is the one that I would I would check out. So again, it's Mind Pump is the podcast. You'll like it. And do you do like, like instead of crackers, do you do any actual like, like, breads at all or is it pretty much impossible to have like a like an actual yeah. high fat low carb bread no it is that there's, there's a hazelnut bread and you can make it with any type of nuts i actually had somebody email me hazelnuts are so expensive at the moment can i take anything else you can use almond butter or cashew butter or whatever obviously the the carb content will will vary a little bit but it's it's lovely uh totally looks like a bread it's got the texture of a bread and uh, with a bit of butter, for instance, it's lovely. And for my kids, I just then put, you know, something, something sweet on top or um, whatever. So it is a, a family friendly bread. And then we've got um, muffins as well, you know, with coconut flour is very, is, is, is very handy for muffins and breads as well. So I usually use those. And yeah, the vegetable muffins are fantastic because you can also do them in a, in a loaf and it's just a load of um, carrots, spinach, red onions, courgette, or what you would call zucchini, and garlic, and then a lot of melted butter, which just gives it just such great flavor, and some coconut milk, and a lot of egg. 
Um, and it's almost like a cross between a sort of quiche slash muffin. But these are wonderful and you can do it in a whole loaf and do slices of it. So, again, it's like, you know, I, I think as Patricia was referring to earlier about us being reluctant to put in desserts and, and sweet things. Um, you know, I, th- I think it, it's it's great though to have things like this, um, especially for vessels, you know, for things like butter or cheese or something or, you know, different dips, uh, lovely pesto dips and so on that we have. And um, those are the things sometimes you really miss when you are eating low carb, you know, as you were talking about your wife making sourdough. I'd eat sourdough morning, noon and night if I could. <laughs> I absolutely adore it. Um, and uh, but that that's it's one of those things that you really miss. And I think if you have good replacements like that, that are low carb, it, it just really can kind of help you stay on track. OK, what about cereal? Because I kind of like quit eating cereal for a really long time. I used to actually make oatmeal every morning. And my oatmeal Mm -hmm. recipe was just like steel cut oats and water. And then I put as much, uh, speak of the devil, whey protein in there as possible. And then like three (laughs) scoops of peanut butter and some cinnamon. And I'd microwave that for about four minutes until it like basically made like a cookie in a giant bowl. And that was like my breakfast Mm. for probably like three years back when I used to race a lot of triathlon. Like that's just like Mm. what I ate every morning. And now, now I have like a plant-based kind of like high fat smoothie, but I do like cereal. Like, like I, you know, I grew up eating Captain Crunch, of course, uh, peanut butter (laughs) Captain Crunch. And you actually have like a cereal recipe in the book. I think it, I think it's like a cornflake recipe or something like that. But can can you go into how one would actually do a cereal? Well, we have uh, cornflakes and then also granola. The granola is lovely too. It's so delicious. Yeah, that granola is amazing. The, the keto cornflakes, it's basically coconut flakes, which I think are brilliant also, you know, even for snacks or um, they are very satisfying. And then also um, some flaked almonds and then cinnamon. And uh, and then we have, um, it's a, a protein coconut shake, basically, because it would be quite low in protein. So, um, the uh, coconut shake is then with um, we have Sun Warrior using here, or I like New Zest as well, uh, with coconut milk or almond milk or you know whatever people like. And so that's that goes on top then. Okay, so it's just like it's just like basically coconut flakes and then like nuts, like almonds, and then you kind of like cover so that almonds, with like yeah. coconut milk or whatever. You throw some cinnamon in there, and there's there's yeah. pretty much like no grains or no. It's like just like a bunch of crunchy stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'd throw in there if it were me is I would throw, uh, I would throw, cause they are kind of high fat and they're really crunchy and they taste great. I would throw cacao nibs in there. Yeah. That'd yeah, be great too. Yeah. yeah. Really good. Yeah. I'm just so, saying, so, maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. in book number two, you can, you can <laughs> pay me royalty on that recipe. Exactly, uh, yeah. Okay. I've got another one that a lot of people kind of like quit eating when they quit eating, you know, a high carb diet. Uh, and that would be pizza. How do you do pizza? How, how do you do like like a low carbohydrate pizza, especially when it comes to the crust? Yeah, well, this is this is when we so we have two different types of pizza. We have one vegetarian one, which is um, a, a cauliflower base. Uh, and my sister in law, uh, she's she's a chef over in, in New York, and um, for years she's vegan and raw food enthusiast. She wrote a fantastic book with um, Talia Rose. And um, so she gave me the recipe for this cauliflower pizza and uh, it's brilliant. She just blitz ca- a raw cauliflower uh, until it be- you know, becomes sort of breadcrumb like. And uh, then you bind it with some soft goat cheese and egg and then you spread it out and you blind bake it. So you bake it in the oven until it dries out a bit and, and it forms this wonderful base. Um, and then you can top it with a really simple tomato sauce that you make, you know, sauteing off some onions, adding some tomatoes and red pepper, a load of thyme and some garlic, uh, and then making some courgette ribbons and topping it with a little goat's cheese and a little drizzle of olive oil. And um, that's a fantastic, really nice vegetarian kind of pizza that is also really good the next day cold. But the other pizza that we have is uh, a meat pizza. And this is one of Patricia's <laughs> recipes. And I got um, a lot of slagging for yeah, you. Yeah, Dominic was, this is, I was, can't possibly put this in. Yeah, the book, I was horrified. Disgusting. I was absolutely <laughs> horrified when I read it. And uh, we 
I tease her, I say it's like her Homer Simpson pizza because it's uh, the base is made with ground or minced lamb or beef and you mix it with some uh, whole grain mustard and herbs and so on and you just flatten it out uh, and you bake it and then we top it with uh, a lovely sautéed mixture of spinach and mushrooms and then some artichoke hearts and a little parmesan or manchego pizza. We also put a, a sort of, instead of the tomato sauce, this lovely hemp um, and sun-dried tomato pesto that we have a recipe for. And when we were when we finished writing the book, we were shooting some videos um, and uh, we made this pizza. And I swear, all the all the cameramen and the lighting guys just basically, <laughs> they were in heaven. They were Sounds just eating really this good. meat pizza thinking... <laughs> Yeah, basically declaring their love for Patricia. I, I, need, it. I need to give it to my wife because, like, you know, in addition to the to the flax and coconut focaccia bread, which you make with like milled flax seeds and it's coconut so good. and chia that's seeds, uh, it looks like your pizza base is just basically ground up almonds and ground up Brazil nuts and butter, yes. and you just basically mix. So, so what what you do that's is you mix. Tart. Okay, you mix all that that's together. Yeah, that's yeah, I, think, recipe, I think yeah. that's another one. That's like a kind of tart base, a sort of yeah, it's like a quiche. Yeah. No, it's like it's um, like the base. the the pizza base that you have in here is you you, you mix. Oh uh, yeah, we have another you mix, one. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, you mix <laughs> almonds and you mix Brazil nuts. Then you yeah. add the egg and you add the water, and that's the dough. It's just like nuts and egg yeah. and yeah. water, and then you put that in the oil pan and you bake it. And oh, it looks like you put coconut flour and salt in there too, and then you just bake that, and that's your base for the pizza. Manchego pizza, I think. Yeah, exactly. There's like no flour. Uh, I mean, it's, in, it's yeah, yeah. It's incredibly rich. So you know, if if anybody says, "Oh well, <laughs> I need to put on weight, what to eat," you know, that's that could be the one. But uh, I think yeah, it's the nutty pizza nutty base. Pizza base. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, that's a really that's a really nice one as well. And I always sort of I actually. I think that freezes really well, that pizza base. So I always check, does it freeze or not? Because I, I like to make double the amount. And uh, yeah, that's a really nice one too. Yeah, so especially three pizzas, three yeah. pizza bases that we have uh, in the book, which is not bad considering it's all low carb or, or ketogenic. It's a pretty I good know. strike rate. I know. It, it, it just like, I, I, I love reading books like this and then going in the kitchen, figure out how to, how to put it. Cause my wife has, has a pantry full of every single like flour and like coconut and banana or, or bread fruit and almond flour. And she has all this stuff cause she cooks a lot more than I do, but I like to go in and tinker when I read books like this and, and see what I can make <laughs> in the process. My boys and I both. Uh, you also have something in there, speaking of tinkering with new recipes, called tamaki, T-E-M-A-K-I. I'd never really heard of tamaki. tamaki. Yeah, yeah. What, what is mm -hmm. that? And then what, what, what's the recipe and why is this included in there? Because it looks really yeah. simple, but I wanted to ask you about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's sort of um, inspired by Japanese. I love sushi and uh, Japanese food, and uh, they generally fill it with lots of rice. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it would be a typical tamaki recipe. Would be it's the um, uh, you know the the nori seaweed that is on the outer. So you usually use it as a wrap. So the seaweed is your wrap, right? And it actually looks like a thin wrap. And uh, so traditionally, they would put lots of, you know, rice and avocado and fish and uh, different things that wouldn't be very keto friendly. But what, what we did is we put, um, you can pretty much put anything, but we have roast chicken and then um, spinach and uh, pesto. So uh, Japanese people probably pulled their hair out. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it's it's just a really quick lunch. I usually I always have pesto in the fridge. That's just uh, always a given. And um, we have several pesto recipes in the book. Mm -hmm. And most people have a bit of spinach as well. And um, so it's it's really sort of a leftover uh, recipe where you can just use your imagination and just uh, take the seaweed and stuff it with whatever you want. And we just give a, a bit of inspiration there. And uh, yeah, it could be a complete meal because it's we we sort of uh, use a bit of coconut oil to um, fry the chicken, leftover yeah. chicken, and That's, spinach. It's it's and, basically yeah. you know in looking over it because it's like a meat. And usually, what I use is sardines for lunch, but I'll just mm, take sardines yeah. with a few vegetables and I wrap them up in seaweed. But I actually do use rice. I use a rice made from a Japanese yam. It's no calories mm. and it's no carbs. It's it's made by this company called Miracle Noodles. 
And so I oh, wrap yeah. that, yeah. I, I wrap that as my rice up in the seaweed wrap. And so I still get kind of like that, that filler in the seaweed. I'm getting hungry talking yeah. about it because it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> I'm not gonna go up and make some after this. But yeah, I mean that that's how that's how I get the rice component. Is I have you tried this before? These these Japanese yam noodles. Yeah, the shirataki. We actually have a recipe in there as well oh, for shirataki noodles. Yeah, and uh, you need to wash them really well, otherwise they smell like rotten eggs. <laughs> So I always warn people when they open the package. Uh, but we, we have a recipe in there as well. We're just trying to find it. And, uh, yeah, it's, um, it is shirataki. Uh, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's something like I always have the shirataki fettuccine and shirataki capellini, shirataki spaghetti, shirataki rice. Like I have a whole box <laughs> of it in my pantry that I'm constantly dipping into. Uh, my wife doesn't care for mm. it. Uh, too much, but like my, my, my boys don't mind it. And we even did like a, we did, uh, my boys last year at the paleo FX conference actually taught a mm -hmm. cooking class and their cooking class was, uh, they made pad thai, but they actually used these shirataki noodles for mm. the pad thai. And it was really good. They also used instead of chicken, uh, crickets of all things. So it was like a cricket shirataki mm. noodle recipe. I have it set. Like if you go to Ben Greedful fitness, actually I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. If anybody listening in wants, yeah, my, cool. wants my kids pad thai recipe with the, with the miracle <laughs> noodles, I'll, I'll put it in there. Um, and, yeah. and again, go to Ben Greenfield fitness.com slash keto kitchen for any of this stuff. Uh, let's go, let's talk about, uh, one of those things that I think is super popular, of course, among this whole like ketogenic low carb diet movement. And that's coffee. You have <laughs> in the book, uh, a, a little bit of a discussion about coffee and specifically the fact that you found a lot of your clients complain about nausea or bloating or a lack of appetite for a long time after mm. consuming the traditional kind of like, I guess, bulletproof coffee recipe. And instead, hopefully Dave doesn't care about us saying this too much. You, you instead have your recipe for bulletproof-ish coffee. Uh, what, yeah. what is bulletproof-ish coffee? Yeah, we basically, I mean... Obviously, you know, Dave, you you can't just take exactly his recipe, but it's it's such a big thing now. And what what I like is, or what a lot of my clients like, is just to reduce dairy a little bit. So we just use different um, kinds of, of fats in this uh, particular coffee. So uh, it's I think Dave uses uh, MCT oil, butter, uh, MCT oil, MCT, yeah. and um, does he use coconut oil? I don't even know. Yeah, co well, coconut oil or like brain, like C A uh, brain yeah. octane type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. High so we, we talk about yeah, exactly. We talk about MCT, and um, I mean, I, I have to say, you know, most people they they're okay to tolerate his uh, MCT, the brain octane, but any other ones sometimes they can, you know, if they're probably more C tens than C eights or you know whatever is in there or it's not quite as as pure it can cause in in some very sensitive people it can cause significant um actually diarrhea or just cramps so we were a bit careful not to you know just go go home with that and just get everybody to use it without giving a bit of um a caveat so some people obviously coconut oil is not the same as mct oil there's a lot of fluoric acid as well it's not pure uh, and other fatty acids it's not pure um mct you know for some people it's um it's enough and we also use cocoa butter in there but you know it, it always depends a bit some people say i find it really really helpful to help elevate my ketones and it doesn't um insulin so some people they find it easier to actually ease into fasting that way just by having a bulletproof coffee in the morning because they couldn't just have nothing at all. And um, so for some people, it, I think it definitely has a place. It's it's really good. But again, you know, it's just it's just liquid calories. So, yeah. mm. you know, if somebody say has to lose has to lose a bit of weight, which actually, you know, is is can be the case with some um, cancer patients, obviously not using losing muscle or whatever, but um, you know, it, it certainly doesn't do any harm. I prefer that they actually 
eat food rather than you know, <laughs> eat calories in, in food form rather than drinking it because it's very easy as we discussed earlier then to just go shoot overboard yeah especially if somebody is a bit of an emotional eater or, yeah. or coffee drinker yeah so basically it's, it's it's just like your hot coffee or your tea and you're mixing it with mm. coconut oil with butter and with with cocoa butter, cocoa butter. those are like cocoa the three main yeah. components Mm. Yeah, exactly. But we also have, there's a keto coffee as well, where you make it with some actually tinned coconut milk and coconut oil and, and a little vanilla. So there's two two different variations right. um, of it. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's sort of one of those things. I think yeah, it, it's like a lot of these things, they become fads and, and people kind of go crazy for them. And then you hear people like literally, as you said earlier, adding sticks of butter to the coffee and eating loads and everything. And you're kind of going, you're missing the point. You know? <laughs> this is, you know, if you if you have just endless calories and endless amounts, you know, it, it it's it's hard and people do need to balance it. And I think it, it goes back to what Patricia is saying, like trying to eat real food where the you know that it's really nutrient dense is probably a better way to go. Yeah. Well, for those of you listening in, from no grain, nut, kale, and seed bread, which you have to try, to (laughs) white chocolate, to banana ice cream, to a whole host of things you never would have thought that you could eat on a low-carb, ketogenic diet, they're all in here, and it's it's a really well-done book with amazing pictures. So it's going to be over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash keto kitchen if you want to add this one to your pantry. I think it's a great addition. And uh, Patricia and Dominie, it was it was really nice to have your fantastic lolling Irish accents on the show today. <laughs> Uh, and and thank you for writing this book. It, it really is a, a great read. I thought it when I got it, it was just going to be yet another cookbook, but it's actually got oh. some really tasty, unique low carb recipes in here. So so nice job, and thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you very much for having <laughs> us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It really has. Awesome. All right, folks. Well, I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Patricia and Dominique, authors of The Ketogenic Kitchen. Check it out at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash keto kitchen. Signing out. Have a healthy week. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 